The 90s saw the rise of some big, big stars, but few of them reached the enormous levels of fame that Leonardo DiCaprio did. He began the decade as a newcomer to Hollywood and ended it with Titanic, one of the biggest films in cinema history. His popularity was so huge that teenage girls were hysterical in their devotion to him. From early on in his career, Leo got to work with the greats. De Niro in This Boy's Life, Johnny Depp in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, Gene Hackman, Sharon Stone and Russell Crowe in The Quick and the Dead, but it was Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet that made him a star. With a killer soundtrack, the modern-day take on a Shakespeare classic was a worldwide hit. Then came James Cameron's Titanic. It broke all the records and sent Leo Starr into outer space. But through it all, he tried to remain grounded. Well, you know, it, it, is, it is difficult at times, you know. Things start to change around you and you try and maintain the, to be the, the same person that you were, but obviously you need to adapt to the situation as well, you know, so you almost develop different personalities in a sense, which is uh, something that I'm working on, you know. This is, all, this is all definitely new to me. I just, you know, for the most part, all I care about is, you know, growing and, and learning more and doing doing good films, you know, career-wise. So whatever can maintain that is most important. Leo was born and raised in Hollywood. He actually made his on-screen debut on Romper Room, where he got kicked off for bad behaviour. Sure, it was an initial setback, but it didn't dampen his enthusiasm. He had a desire to perform, and in his early teens, he got his first agent. My expectations for, for coming to this business weren't really anything. I thought, OK, maybe I'll get a commercial or two or get a TV show, or hopefully a movie, and it'll pay for you know, my, my college tuition. Um, and that, that was my attitude coming into it. And I just, you know, it was a series of, I just felt like, uh, you know, I perpetuated because it was something that I loved doing. And I kept doing it and I kept hacking away and I, I eventually got lucky. He certainly did. After small roles in soaps and television series, 18-year-old DiCaprio scored the role that got him noticed, This Boy's Life. But it was the action-packed romance of Titanic that made him a superstar. The film won 11 Oscars, took 1.8 billion at the box office and was responsible for Leo Mania. His face was on every magazine and he became a tabloid favourite. You adapt, you carry on and you get to a place where you just have a certain amount of acceptance towards it and you realise that it is true. Once you establish with yourself that it is out of your control and you really have no control in the situation <laughs> and you're really pretty much, you know, a result of what anyone at any time could say anything they want and it could mutate into, you know, if it's an out and out lie, it could, you know, eventually be thought of as the truth and you can't do anything about that. And you just have to sort of realise that along with that con becomes, uh, there, there is the, the, the fantastic thing, which is the opportunity to be a performer and let that speak for who you are as opposed to anything else. You know, that's what I choose to, you know, let's speak for who I am. I don't want to comment on, you know, every little th damn thing right. <laughs> said, you know, that I want... I want my art to sort of speak for who I am because that's what I do. In 2002, Leo teamed up with director Martin Scorsese for Gangs of New York. Leo's dream of working with Marty, as they call him in the biz, was realised and the film was a big success. I remember somebody telling me, oh, there's this Martin Scorsese uh, project about, you know, young Irish immigrants and gangsters. It's called Gangs of New York, blah, blah, blah. He's been wanting to do it for ages. I said, well, God, I have to do that. I have to do that. So I, I actually left my old agent to go with a new agent when I was like 17 in hopes to meet with, uh, meet with Marty and, and get this project going. Never ended up meeting Marty <laughs> for the next, you know, six years. Then finally, uh, I was represented by Rick Yorn and uh, uh, Mike Ovitz was working with him and he had a history with Marty and uh, I said to them, look, you know, get me this, get me this project. Let's do this. I want to do this with Marty. And they started talking with Marty and Marty, they asked Marty what he wanted to do. He coincidentally said that he'd been wanting to do that for a while. And then uh, I, I was uh, doing the beach in Thailand and I got a phone call saying that, you know, he was, he wanted to do Gangs of New York with me and I was I, in shock. <laughs> Leo is an actor that I've been looking at for a number of years. Uh, my friend Robert De Niro told me about working with him in This Boy's Life, in which he said he's uh, 15 years old, I think, at the time. He said he's a very good actor and watch this kid. He's, 
He's really interesting. So back around 94, 95, I knew about him. Um, and then, of course, I saw him in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, a number of other pictures, and um, always admired him as an actor, always, always thought at some point to work with him. And then, um, of course, the Titanic uh, uh, film was released. Uh, it also gave him a certain amount of uh, bankability. And so both these, this combination was a very good one and uh, was presented to me. And it turned out that he liked my movies, and so we decided to make this picture together. That one was such a great success that the two went on to make The Aviator and then The Departed. And the respect Leo had for Marty before the two met only increased after working with him. His, his authenticity is just amazing, and his, his attitude towards filmmaking still at this age and his, this stage in his career is amazing. He's, he's a film fanatic, and he loves making movies more than anyone I've ever seen in my life. Likewise, Scorsese came to appreciate Leo's ability to interpret characters in his own unique way. And that's why he personally kept choosing DiCaprio for roles in his films. It was more of confidence in him, uh, feeling comfortable and confident that uh, as a performer, uh, he's going to find some place in this character that's going to be really interesting. As a younger actor, Leo played roles with great turmoil. A junkie, a gunslinger, a whore and a bisexual poet, leading to speculation that he himself was a troubled teen. However, Leo insists that wasn't the case. He thinks of himself as a rebel only in the sense that he tries to be an individual. He chooses tough roles in order to push himself. And at 20, he was Oscar nominated for his performance in What's Eating Gilbert Grape. His unique roles got him noticed, and from early on, Hollywood's biggest stars have appreciated Leo's work. How can you not know that Leo is the guy in, in What's Eating Gilbert Grape and, and Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet? I, I, I didn't know Leo, but I always viewed him as the, the finest actor of his generation, a guy who's already made incredibly uh, uh, bold choices in, in what the type of work that he wanted to do. And listen, I'll, I'll try to hang on to Leo's coattails, as, provided he wears a coat. In 2006, he received another Oscar nomination for his role in Blood Diamond, a film based on the bloodshed that results from the illegal diamond trade. The movie made a big impression on Leo. I didn't quite know how it has dramatically affected people to, and to what degree in Africa. Um, so now that I'm more conscious of it, you know, it's, it's something that I have certainly a different attitude about. and I. And you know, it's a very complicated issue though, because I don't think that anyone's saying, don't buy diamonds at all. I don't, th I don't, I think that's the wrong message. It's, it's about specifically saying, you know, if there is any percentage of, of conflict diamonds still out there, anything that's still contributing to situations like this, they have to be stopped, you know? Leo has worked with the best in the business and all praise his ability and enthusiasm for his work. In 2008, he starred in Ridley Scott's Body of Lies, alongside Russell Crowe. Their on-screen characters didn't see eye to eye, and it seems the same was true when they were hanging out on set together. We share a work ethic, an aesthetic, and a sense of humour. And if you cut those three things together, then being on a set together is easy. People make the assumption that we agree on everything. And that's, that's ridiculous, you know, because they say, how can there be, you know, conflict in your art if the two of you just see everything the same way? It's like, absolutely not. You know, 70% of anything on any subject we have an instinctive disagreement about, you know? But over time, we've perfected the art of the wordless argument, mm -hmm. and uh, we enjoy the process of problem solving. But it wasn't just problem solving they enjoyed on set. Russell had some of his own fun at Leo's expense. You know, there was one particular trick I used to play on him, like once a week, where I'd walk into the makeup trailer with a little can of Evian water, you know, hidden in my hand. And as I walked past him on the makeup chair, I'd, I'd sneeze and spray him in the back of the neck with the Evian water, you know. And for weeks, he thought this disgusting pig of a man was putting his mucus <laughs> back of his neck every week. And it was all I could do to keep the joke going, because just the look in his eyes every now and then, and just, you know, because he, he kind of, he liked me and he liked hanging out with me, but why does he sneeze on me, you know? And it was just this thing. And occasionally I'd have to actually leave the makeup trailer, because I, you know, and roll around in the dust laughing, and then go back in, you know? And then probably about halfway through the film or whatever, one day I just held the can up and went, and he was like, 
he couldn't believe it, but it was like, in, a, in another way, he was really relieved as well, you know, that I wasn't that other bloke that he'd been imagining. Leo has won great praise for his voice work. For Blood Diamond, he learnt the Africana accent. And for Body of Lies, he had to master Arabic. He's uh, fervently um, professional and will get the Arabic right. He said, you really want me to say this? I said, yeah, he said, OK. So he'll say, because I want to really learn it. I said, I know. He said, are you sure you don't want it half the length? I said, no. And um, he'll learn it, absolutely. And uh, to the extent that, I've got, obviously, we have Arab consultants on the side, and I'll, at the end of it, go look at them, they go, it's pretty good. And so he gets every inflection right. And his preparation is uh, seamless. M nearly more than anyone else I've seen. After the huge success of Romeo and Juliet, followed by the mega hit of Titanic, Leo was arguably the biggest star in the world to the extent that his popularity was compared to Beatlemania. His diverse talents have seen him work with the biggest and best directors, people like Spielberg, Scorsese, Ridley Scott, James Cameron, and I'm sure they and many others have got plenty of sensational roles in store for the legendary Leo. Stay tuned to Star Picks for all the movies you know and the actors you love. Broadcast in glorious high definition with 5.1 surround sound where available. For more of the best in entertainment news, check out your movie network channels. It's all together better on screen and at mnc.tv.